This is a conversation with Nirmal Raja. He's the education coordinator at Maliha Archaeological Center in Sharjah and the co-founder of a popular YouTube science channel, Scientific Tamilians. He's a science communicator specializing in archaeology, paleontology, natural history, and evolutionary biology. In this episode, we discuss dinosaurs, Jurassic Park, the origin of life, fossils, and aliens. This is no time. If you like what you see, then do hit subscribe on YouTube. Just smash that button nice there. Or if you like the audio version, then you can follow this channel on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Anchor. This project continues to take a lot of my time, money, and efforts. If you'd like to see it continue, do consider making a small donation on Patreon. For other forms of love and support, you can follow this channel on Instagram or Twitter, or follow me personally. And now, I'm very good. I'm very good at this. It's no time. In the movie Jurassic Park, there's a scene where the kids start telling really bad jokes to escape from the dinosaurs to go... to not feel scared about it. so that i'm doing the same about this interview as well okay. i've decided to put really bad dinosaur jokes all across this interview so the first one is this classic which is what do you call a dinosaur that's just broken up with his girlfriend um i think you've heard of this no tyrannosaurus x <laughs> so now that we've got that out of the way <laughs> let's start with the actual interview so the year is 1993 and a movie called Jurassic Park comes out in the theaters Do you remember watching it and what was your reaction what impact did that movie have on you Yeah um honestly say I watched the movie in, in theaters um my father happened to be uh, a cinema sound engineer so he 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 works closely with movie theaters and Jurassic Park as you know like it's the first movie with digital surround sound So there was a theater in my place it's a very small town and they wanted to experiment with new sound features and they had my father and my grandfather happened to be a sound engineer too so basically what happened is like these guys have access to movie theaters i was in kindergarten and uh, they took me to the movie through my school so like we paid 5 rupees and like we just went and watched that yeah. movie and then when i came back the movie was absolutely amazing and i like, told my father like i want to go and watch the movie and he said like he had an assistant and he said like okay go with him and watch the movie so i watched the movie the second time when i came back i was like really impressed I went to my grandfather this time and said like I haven't seen the movie I just want to go and watch it and he said like okay go over so basically when I was in kindergarten I watched yeah. this movie three times and uh, and 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 like fast forward like 30 years and people ask me like what kind of uh, impressed you I mean like what sort of uh, about the movie uh, I mean like what made you go after fossils and what made you go after dinosaurs I would like proudly say Jurassic Park I mean like people might like wonder I mean like it's not a book not a scientific paper but a movie but just just go and ask any paleontologist or anybody who owned a geology over 30 years old they would happily say Jurassic Park so i i vividly remember the movie and the first scene and uh, it is a scary movie back then but like for some reason i really loved it and i just went back home and i started digging up stuff like i didn't find any fossils in my backyard just like on old pipes and stuff so uh, my dream came true only in 2006 um like it was like after 20 or 18 years after the movie came and i just found my first fossil so jurassic park had a huge in, uh, impact on my You're life a living example of how movies can really influence oh, yeah, people I'm, and a lot of people talk about we want to do movies so that kids can get inspired but you are living proof that actually jurassic park had a great impact on you and now you are doing great work in that field itself so one of the questions from that movie is should you create a jurassic park or but let's go let's go one step back can we create a jurassic park today uh, do we have the technology to clone dinosaurs yeah i mean like if you do you want a really uh, uh, like interesting answer or you really want the reality thing i mean like real uh, something that answers that is grounded in reality give us both <laughs> yeah uh, if you ask me should we create a jurassic park i would say yes we should i mean like the movie uh, some people i mean like there are memes around saying that like why it is a bad idea uh but I think this is break out just for the movie because Spielberg wanted to. So only then you can actually make a good story. But if you ask me like should we really create a Jurassic Park? Yes. Um there are animals that are going extinct and uh, molecular biology is like so advanced and it's going to be advanced. I mean like it's it's moving forward uh, that we can actually clone animals that went extinct. So cloning dinosaurs, I mean dinosaurs are quite uh, famous. Uh so if you just go around and say like I'm 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 going to just like, you know, bring back uh, a dinosaur or, or just a bird random bird that went extinct uh, with the passenger pigeon uh people like 
that's not interesting i'm like who wants a passenger pigeon i'm like can you really tell the difference between a passenger pigeon and a normal one but yeah. dinosaurs are quite exciting so yes that we should create a, a jurassic park okay. sure so then we'll go into the second question when yeah. which jeff goldblum as well said in the movie was that your scientists were so preoccupied with <laughs> whether they could they never stopped to think whether they should so should we create a jurassic park uh, yeah i mean uh, apart from that one i mean like yeah he was being a bit pessimistic in that movie i really love uh, uh, ian malcolm uh, i i love the way that he talks about chaos theory but the thing is like i i still there, there is a bit of me that like kind of disagrees with him i'm like saying like no you you can I mean, like if you like we have genetically modified crops like we've been having uh, genetic modified crops for several years from today and like yeah. we haven't seen any any crop turn into um, a monster or something <laughs> it's still like people that never yeah. got cancer I mean, like there are no literally zero evidence that anybody yeah. got cancer using uh, gm crops so uh, I, i think we should really uh, uh, create one uh, at least to show how how much we can actually do on environment i mean like yeah we when I mean, we say like uh, uh, the environment is declining uh, like extinction sixth extinction happening in the anthropocene things are going bad and like really want to have something like that one to make sure uh it things doesn't go really bad but the thing is like can we create one uh yeah i mean like the the not so interesting answer is like um, modern day cladistics we we we've been moving forward in classification and taxonomy so until recently people thought dinosaurs I mean, like birds yeah. the ones that you see flying around descended from dinosaurs but now we don't we, we do know that like birds are not only descended from dinosaurs birds literally are dinosaurs so uh so even now when you just go around and say dinosaurs went extinct it's it's kind of wrong to say the dinosaurs went extinct you should actually say the non avian dinosaurs the dinosaurs that couldn't fly uh, went extinct and the flying ones survived and like that's something that we see today the only thing is like they lost all the ferocious nature but still I mean like if you just go to any birds of prey like it's scary so you're saying man and dinosaur already are surviving together birds and man are already absolutely yeah. absolutely i mean like that's it might be a bit uh, hard to accept but still yeah just because like we've seen dinosaurs going run, running amok you know chasing people uh, especially and malcolm and yeah. uh, it, it's quite hard to accept birds as dinosaurs all those ferocious <laughs> beings but still birds are like birds are amazing creatures okay so let's talk a bit more about dinosaurs and like i said i have a lot of bad jokes throughout this interview so to introduce this segment i have another terrible joke and this one is why did the dinosaur cross the road oh uh, it's just because is it is it like because like we say chicken uh, cross the dinosaur so i love that you try to guess the jokes <laughs> <laughs> yeah because the chicken hasn't evolved yet oh. yeah. <laughs> as you mentioned the birds are still living uh living descendants of the dinosaurs okay so let's talk a bit more about them um what are some of the most impressive dinosaurs for you or the ones that really fascinate you the most well uh, if you ask me i mean like it, it it's it's quite tough to say something uh, a favorite dinosaur i mean like dinosaurs by by definition they are like absolutely amazing creatures uh because there are different types of dinosaurs there are theropods there are sauropods and uh, ornithischians and uh if you ask me it's really hard to pick one favorite dinosaur but if you ask me like i would say a dinosaur called trudon so trudon is like a very small medium sized dinosaur hardly like say uh, less than 5 to 4 feet long uh, dinosaur it's a very tiny like 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 a little dog but i think it's like trudon had a very big brain case and uh, if we can uh, correlate brain size with intelligence i mean like this is an animal that has a bigger brain body ratio uh so we have a word for this right encephalization ratio something yeah so if you ask which dinosaur i mean like if we have stegosaurus which is a really huge dinosaur but it has right. a very small head and a very small brain case mm-hmm. looking at the brain case trudon looks like it might be one of might have been one of the most intelligent dinosaurs at all mm-hmm. we right, right now we know that like you know birds are inter- like very intelligent we have seen uh, there are several youtube videos of crows doing some amazing uh, uh events i mean like amazing things like you know throwing garbage in a trash can yeah. so birds can learn so if that's the case trudon might have been one of the most smartest dinosaur the thing is like trudon is actually found in different parts of uh, the world but not necessarily in india so un- until recently um there's a team from uh, london uh, kings college london right. they actually came around and they actually found um uh, in arilur they found a tooth of a trudon 
So now we do know that Trudon not only lived in North America and China and all the other areas, he also lived in South India. So uh, Trudon is like, if you ask me, it's, it's one of my favorite dinosaurs as of now. Be before it was like, uh, you know, Giraffe Titan, the Brachiosaurus in Jurassic Park. Yeah. Uh, impressive ones, beautiful ones also, especially the songs that they uh, sing in the movie. I mean, no, we do know more about how the vocalizations in dinosaurs uh, were like right now, but still, the movie kind of like, you know, still has an impact on you. Uh, this is another, you mentioned the size and I just thought of it. So I believe Velociraptors were not as big as they showed in the movie, right? They yeah, were yeah. Much I'm, smaller. Yeah, Velociraptors were much more smaller. The, yeah. the actual, the curious thing is like, say, for example, when they, when Spielberg actually made the movie, um, so Velociraptors were actually based on a dinosaur called Dinonicus. So, Velociraptors were not that big. So basically what happens is like after the movie came, uh, there was a guy called Jim Kirkland. He, he's the state paleontologist in Utah State. So he actually went around and found a dinosaur, the same size of the Velociraptors that they show in the movie. They, they had the huge killing claws. They were like totally big. And they were exactly like the ones that they showed in the movie, except that this one is called Uthoraptor. Uh, so uh, Velociraptors were really big. I mean, like if you really happen to literally uh, call uh, the dinosaurs in, in, in like in Jurassic Park, those are not Velociraptors, but they were, those were like Uthoraptors, and they were feathered. So um, it was not only smaller, it was also feathered. This is another thing that was not told to me when I was young, was that dinosaurs, most of them apparently had some form of hair or feathers. Yeah. So the picture that we have of them, of these lizards, that's... That's slightly off, right? They were more like birds. It is like, and that's the reason why Jurassic Park is one of the most uh, um, uh, amazing movies ever made. The thing is like the cultural impact and the scientific revolution it created. I mean, they basically, until 1993, before the 80s, people understood dinosaurs are slow moving reptiles. They can't, they move really slowly. They don't have a fast metabolism and they, they, they get like sloths and they're like- Very dumb. Like, yeah. yeah, very dumb. Yeah. But the thing is like, after that one, the dinosaur revolution happened when people started finding more evidence for dinosaur being very active. They were, they were like exactly the ones that they showed in the movie. And Jurassic Park happens to be the first movie that showed dinosaurs in that way. It was very close to reality than it is compared to the previous movies. So uh, most of the, and, and other things like more, th we, we started digging more, we started collecting more fossils, especially the fossils from China. So those fossils were impressive, so impressive. They were well preserved that even the soft parts, so when it comes to fossils, only the hard parts uh, end up as fossil. The soft parts rots away and eaten by bacteria or by other environmental factors. But you don't see them anymore. So when it comes to uh, uh, dinosaurs, the recent fossils actually show that dinosaurs were furry. So there are some dinosaurs like Sinosopteryx, Cordyptrix, and other ones that were densely feathered. And we also have evidences that Uthoraptor had quill, uh, quill feathers uh, in their arms. So we have small markings in their arm bones that shows that these uh, dinosaurs had feathers uh, all over the body. The thing is like these feathers didn't really help these animals to fly, but initially it could have helped these animals to maintain their uh, temperature. It, yeah. it might have helped them to keep warm. And at one point it started helping them to run faster, glide, and then it, it started flying with it. So evolution is more about repurposing existing uh, organs. Mm -hmm. So it's not like like suddenly the environment changed that you evolve a new trait. But instead of evolving a new trait, what you what normally animals, what populations do is to repurpose something which is already there. So in this case, what these animals evolved to keep them warm, help them to glide and later to fly. So this image that I have of this dinosaur, this giant lizard that's chasing me could actually be a giant bird. That's it, just, it just looks like a bird, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, just go after, like, like I, I, I've always think, like, thought about uh, uh, an ostrich chasing you. Yeah. Imagine, like, an ostrich kicking you or running after you. I mean, like, these are giant birds. I saw, I saw a vulture in a zoo recently. Uh, like, normally you, you see all these animals flying really high. Like, very rarely, it, it was a painful sight to see these animals being chained. But they really had to have a really thick chain to uh, tie the animal to the uh, bark of a tree. That's That was huge. Like, there are very huge birds, uh, arctic terns and other things. They're really albatross. These are very huge birds. I mean, like, we hardly, uh, uh, like, we kind of overestimate or underestimate their size uh, often because birds are flying really high. Yeah. We don't see them very up and close. But birds are impressively, um, some birds are impressively big. And, like, you should actually see the claws of a raptor. 
birds of prey like just the normal vultures and eagles and owls i i um i took my little daughter to a, mu- a zoo recently and uh, i happened to show i mean like there was a parrot and uh, they made the parrot sit on my finger I, I, like only after that one I, i realized how sharp the talons are yeah. it was really sharp i mean like imagine something like a heavy animal just like pouncing on you and like doing the same to you uh, just not a parrot but a dinosaur so so birds are terif- like terrifying creatures again like in in a way so if you ever want to uh, live out your dream of getting chased by a dinosaur just get chased by a bird That's the same <laughs> thing yes. okay so one of the topics of interest i would say i wouldn't say it's a mystery anymore is how the dinosaurs or the cretaceous dinosaurs or just the land dinosaurs went extinct or uh, that i hope i'm using the right words and while there is a massive crater in mexico that validates that there was a meteor impact there is still debate about it whether they were on the decline or whether it was an actual instant event that caused it so where do you stand on this what do you think was the most likely cause um uh, so basically um, uh, most of the fossils that i find every year is in a southern uh, state called tamil nadu there's a place called arilur and perambalur that two, two districts that has a lot of cretaceous deposits so basically you can actually go around and find fossils of animals that lived by the end time by the by, by the time when the cretaceous period ended uh once one strange thing is like there is there is a researcher from princeton university called greta keller so she has a very interesting uh, theory that it's not only the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs but there are multiple Im- impact events and m- other factors that killed the dinosaurs so basically what she says is like uh, the deccan traps as uh, we just go to maharashtra the mumbai area you can actually see the huge deccan uh, eruptions that happened like like the end of the cretaceous period so where i stand is like when you just go take a core so geologists actually drill a core and remove a slice of the rock so you know they can actually see the core and like something like this maybe something like that yeah. one uh so they can actually understand what really happened in the past so so basically uh there is a thing called kt boundary or kpg boundary cretaceous paleogene boundary so this is a dense clay layer that you can actually find all around the world so you found in they found in gubbio in italy they found in us they found in other parts of the world so basically when the huge asteroid struck earth it uh, like threw a lot of iridium in the atmosphere and it started settling down and at one point you can actually see one fine layer of clay rich in iridium and then after that you don't see any dinosaur bones above that one so that kind of marks the end of the dinosaurs but in this case like you don't you don't see the kt boundary in an in india so or even in north india you can actually see it, but southern india you cannot you can really see the kt boundary so what keller and other workers have said uh, something that i would really uh, uh, like to uh, um, believe is that the deccan volcanism made things much more worse so people think all the dinosaurs went extinct 6 to 6 million years ago but dinosaurs were already in the point of decline even before that one some dinosaurs were already going extinct uh, but what i think is like the deccan volcanism might have changed the climate so drastically the dinosaurs were already in the path to decline and the asteroid made it worse it was more like a final nail in the coffin so things are already worse and then you have it's 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 more like we have this we are halfway through the covid pandemic and imagine like if there is one more virus that like turns up that's going to just like mess up things so it's just like things were already bad and the asteroid made it much more worse um, in the book the rise and fall of dinosaurs there's a similar argument where they say that it uh, from what they found is that even vegetation was on the decline it's just seasonal things on that were happening or not and as a result the herbivores dinosaurs were on Absol- the decline absolutely and there was that narrow window where the actual asteroid had impacted exactly and exactly because that those food chains didn't survive and True. they say that if the asteroid had a maybe impact maybe another 100 years later or something of that sort then they it, might have survived so i mean far. even even if the asteroid had missed it by a few kilometers and if it had landed somewhere else the problem is like it landed on the right I don't know if if it is a if it is a right word to say it is a right spot. Uh it it landed on the wrong spot for the dinosaurs. Mm. And the thing is like it landed in a place called Yucatan Peninsula which is rich in limestone and carbonate rocks. So it's 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 more like somebody smoking in a godown full of firecrackers. So <laughs> that kind of made it absolutely worse and the dinosaurs like literally went extinct. I mean like if it had a, if it had crashed somewhere else like maybe they would have survived maybe i mean like although like 66 million years is like quite a lot 
And maybe we might not have uh, dinosaurs like the ones we might have seen something else. I mean, like Trudon, some people actually even uh, theorized like Trudon, if it had not gone extinct, would have evolved into a humanoid form and like as intelligent as humans. So, yeah, wrong events, wrong chain of events, wrong place. Everything went wrong 66 right. million years ago. Why do you think the birds and the frogs and the lizards and crocodiles, why did they survive? Oh, the thing is like um, um, the evolutionary adaptation. So basically birds, they could fly away. They can move from one place to another one. And uh, mammals, uh, what happened is like, so extinction even just like when an event suddenly changes and the animals don't have enough time to adapt to the new environment. So they kind of die out and they don't leave enough um, uh, descendants to repopulate the planet. Uh, mammals did survive because mammals were uh, highly, they can actually, I mean, like, they were adapted to a nocturnal life back then. I mean, like dinosaurs were big and mammals couldn't become any bigger than a normal rabbit. Uh, when the dinosaurs were around. And the thing is, like, mammals survived because they can actually burrow. Uh, they survived the initial impact. And also, they were scavenging, and they tend to leave more descendants than the dinosaurs did. So the environmental stress on the dinosaurs were heavy compared to the mammals and birds. So that's one of the reasons why mammals survived and the dinosaurs didn't. So there are other factors also, factors that we, we, we can never know or we yet to know and understand why mammals survived. Mammals had this advantage over the dinosaurs during the end of the Cretaceous period. But yeah, mammals left a lot of descendants. And like, if you see the fossil record, mammals tend to become bigger after the Cretaceous period. Um, and before that one, they were like very small because of the pressure exerted by the dinosaurs. I think it's important to make a note that when we're talking about the asteroid impact, it's not just the impact but also what chain of events it triggered from yes. there, where there was, it, it caused a lot of volcanic eruptions and then it caused a lot of you know, gases to rise and block out the sun. Absolutely. And it was a complete change in uh, climate for all the dinosaurs that were adapted to a certain climate and they couldn't, and they died out. And more importantly, even for the plants that were in that point. So the vegetation started to die out and then the dinosaurs that fed on that. As a result, the entire food chain started collapsing. So it was not just that one no. event. It, it was, is a multiple event. I mean, yeah. some people even say it's a multiple impact event. It's not a one single impact. So basically, when the asteroid entered Earth's atmosphere, yeah. uh, it started splitting up into several pieces. And it fell in different parts of the world. And and, and only Yucatan Peninsula, the crater survived. The Chicxulub crater survived. And uh, some people even say there's a crater near Mumbai. Uh, called Shiva Crater. And some people even say that like Shiva Crater been dated back to Cretaceous period. Some people say like Astra split into two big pieces. One landed in India, where already the Deccan volcanism is like was worse. And the other one landed in Yucatan Peninsula. But like we are yet to find more uh, uh, evidences for all these uh, claims. So as of now, the, the Chicxulub Crater impact uh, uh, model stands high. So then I have... A slightly personal question for you then based on this how does it really make you feel you know when you sit and think about this because you studied dinosaurs for a while you know how majestic creatures they were they used to rule earth right they were the most powerful and then just like that wiped out completely so my first question for you would be when you actually think about it how does it make you feel about life in general and then how does it make you feel about human civilization and our how temporary our existence is well, that's that's a really good question. So, so, so basically, there are uh, when you just look about all, all the fossils. So, for example, if you pick a, a trilobite, uh, a, a very small animal uh, that lived in the oceans, like they started appearing during the Cambrian period, five hundred and fifty million years ago, and trilobites at one point by the end of the Permian period they went extinct. But the thing is, like, like when you look at human uh, civilization. Civilization itself is like, say, 5,000 years old. And uh, the first humans, anatomically modern humans, are like, say, 300,000 or 350,000 years old. But I think it's like, it's, it's, it's a geological blink of time. So um, the trilobites have been around for a very long time that we can't even comprehend. And, and the thing is like, we, uh, human brains are programmed in a way that we can't think about, we can't comprehend deep time. So we can't we can't think about millions of years. So when I if 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 I just walk walk out now, if I meet you after six months, that might not look like a long time. I'm like you know, like I can't really fathom that uh, deepness of the time. But but millions of years, it's really really tough. So for example, when I say this is eighty five million years, and that one is like eighty three million years, it might not look a bit 
big difference. But that's two million years that's separating that one. I mean, like that's it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. So, so dinosaurs when dinosaurs were around for a very long time, and it's it's kind of sad to think about these magnificent creatures that went extinct just like that because of a random rock falling from the sky. But at the same time, uh, I, I, you can't. I mean, like I can't stop thinking about this one also. The re- the fascination that you have for the dinosaurs is because dinosaurs went extinct. They are not here anymore. I mean, like when you when you just don't have anything. You you uh, like basically gold is precious because gold is rare. Yeah. Diamonds are even costly because you don't see diamonds everywhere. But imagine like just like if somebody d- like drops tons of diamonds around in your car park, like it loses value just like that. You won't have that interest for that one. But in my case, like dinosaurs going extinct is something that actually gives why uh, a feeling that like they are really interesting creatures. But it's kind of sad that they went extinct. But uh, the other thing is like it kind of teaches one more thing. Like no matter how long you're going to be uh, in, in, in the planet, there is going to be events that that kind of you know, like wipe you out. But that's not the end. There is going to be another replacement because the mammals took over. Uh, so like I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a philosophical thing when people say nothing is permanent. But that's kind of true when it comes to evolutionary biology. Like, there, if there is only one thing that is permanent, it's our gene, our DNA that keeps passing its genes to from one generation to another one. Yeah. You touched upon something very interesting. So we have really majestic creatures among us. We have the blue whale, we have elephants, for example, but we are not really as fascinated with them as we are. With, they have become very common things because we're used to it. But dinosaurs, you're right. Part of the fascination is because they went extinct. Yeah. That's a very interesting point. Um, so I just wanted to get your expand on that commentary for humans as well. There are so many obstacles in our way. Any day a super volcano can erupt and that might be the end of civilization. Another asteroid meteor impact. Um, nuclear war, we're always on the brink of that. Uh, rising sea levels. There's so many challenges in our way. And just and like you mentioned, we've been on Earth only for like a blink of a time if you really look at uh, history of time. So do you feel like, are you amazed that we have survived so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, basically, I mean, like when when I say like we are not going to be, we are just like a very young species. But I should not also underestimate what humans have done to the planet. So basically, what happens is like if you just go around, like uh, uh, thinking from a geological point of view. So imagine if there is a geologist coming to this planet. I mean, like just going around. Uh, if I just go to a Cretaceous site and I I go through the layers of rock, and I find bones of animals sticking out here and there. And but apart from that one, I don't I don't see I mean, like a maximum if I, I can actually go around and see a burrow. So for example, I can see a cast of a burrow of a, of a, of a crab or a tube worm. Or if I can actually see a, a, a cast of a burrow of a mammal for the Cretaceous period. But the thing is, like, imagine like everything goes off, humanity is wiped off. And if there is a geologist coming from outer space an alien geologist coming and there's, he's going through, he or she is going through the layers of rock. And suddenly they come across a layer that was like, right now, the Anthropocene. I mean, like, they would be quite amazed that like in, in, in older layers, you know, you just see bones of animals and humans. And suddenly you just don't see anything, just a bone. You would see massive buildings. You would see radioactivity. You would see metals. Uh, all concentrated in different areas. You would see bones of the. I mean, like, these are, I mean, like, this is what uh, Richard Dawkins would call extended phenotype. So, for example, our genes code to build a body. Uh, but, uh, for example, take a beaver. So, a beaver uh, uh, builds a dam. Uh, so, that's something, the gene actually forces the beaver actually to build a dam, which you can actually see. That's an extended phenotype of what a gene can actually do. So, when it comes to us, I mean, like, look out, like the tallest building in the world, we laid uh, telegraph uh, lines through the oceans. I mean, like there is, if you, if I ask you to pick one spot in the planet that does not have a human footprint, you have to. I mean, like it's very tough to pick one spot. You just, you can just go to the deepest part of the world. You see a plastic cover. You see, you see a, a chocolate wrapper. Uh, you just go to the top of Mount Everest, which is the tallest point in the entire planet. And people, like hundred thousand years ago, they couldn't have imagined like climbing all the way up there. But there is trash all over there. So the human impact, although it is negative, but it's kind of uh, astounding to think 
how much we can actually be hadid i mean like for example 550 years of uh, a multicellular evolution none of the species managed to reach the moon none of the uh, species ever no not a single animal that managed to leave uh, the planet and like there was space, we are space faring creatures so uh, and also all these uh, improvements or all these uh, uh, advancements happened in a very short time it happened in like say 200 300 years maximum industrial revolution 1800s and suddenly everything started happening very very quickly and one more thing is like we are no longer bound by our genetic um evolution so evolution is still working on us in a in a in a genetic level but the thing is like we can bypass so uh, if there is a little kid that has a genetic disorder all we can actually do is we have the technology to just go around and edit that gene and and and, and get the kid uh, uh, ready and running so that sort of uh, although when I, when i think about human existence being not so um, impressive we are very uh, young creatures and in, in the planet but the the stuff that we have done um, to the planet is more than just impressive oh, yeah it it did have a negative impact but the thing is like uh, uh, what gives me hope is like if we can actually do some negative stuff i mean like if we can actually make it go bad if you had that capacity of make pushing something to uh, to yeah. the edge of uh, the cliff you also had the capacity to pull it back like you can actually fix it so uh, but it's going to take a lot of time a lot of effort a lot of uh mind change um but yeah it is it is we are a very impressive creatures just like the dinosaurs interesting you mentioned that we are the first creature on earth to have made it to the moon there's a very famous quote that said that the reason dinosaurs went ex- extinct is because they didn't have a space program absolutely, right? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so i have two space theme questions for you one is i want to check this theory with you so this is a theory came across in a book called super intelligence by nick bostrom where he said that if we were to find life on mars that would mean very bad news for us mm-hmm. i think you've come across this in the past yeah so basically the gist is that currently we haven't heard or we don't know of life that any exists anywhere else so our probability of life existing is one out of trillions of planets that we know that are out there and now um what we think is that there's a great filter before us but there are a lot of factors that need to come into play for li- intelligent life to emerge so the climate has to be in the right place the solar system needs to be adapted for that uh these cataclysmic events don't need to happen and then life can emerge out of it so we feel like we've crossed that great filter which is why earth is the only planet we know of, very low probability of life existing but if we do find life on mars then it would mean that there are two planets out of nine in our solar system itself that have life the the probability of life existing comes down from one out of trillions of planets to two out of nine which is massive change in probability and then it seems more likely just because we haven't observed life anywhere else and we haven't heard from anyone else it's more likely that there's a grid filter ahead of us where at some point we'll end up destroying ourselves or something might happen that might cause that destruction what do you think of this theory well it it does but the thing is like when you when you think about um, um the probability of life elsewhere um if you ask me personally uh, what i would say is like the chances are really really high and we are just bound by the space the distance factor So the thing is like imagine if there is a nearest star system that has a habitable planet and if there are intelligent life over there yeah. and if it is like say 20 light years away and um, imagine if they are uh, sending a signal and it's going to take 20 years for us to uh, reach them. like the thing is like one more thing is like we've spent um, so much to spend spacecraft to deep space voyager pioneer we have this golden records and everything but back then 1970s we thought most advanced technology is the the long play uh, vinyl records yeah <laughs> we made it on like well, if 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 i give you the same record can you replay it it's it's quite tough you yeah, don't yeah, i mean like yeah. we've moved on so w- what i'm thinking is like when you when you when you th- talk about evolution uh, life if you if you look at what our history is uh, the planet is like 4.5 billion years old and people thought life is like 3 billion years at one point 3.5 billion years they started finding evidences for life 4 billion years ago if you look at our own planet life is more like it was waiting to happen so basically when the moment when the planet became slightly habitable you just had the first life so although it might look a very improbable event it is kind of a very probable event given the massive time scales the universe have been around so universe have been around for 13 billion years if if life can actually begin on a planet like earth within 500 to 600 
a million years after the earth started cooling down it could also happen in other places but the only thing is like i'm not very sure if if it it is going to even if uh, intelligence is the final what i'm not i don't i don't really think there is a goal for evolution it just like moves on like a water flowing through uh, meandering to a different areas i mean like every small iterations there kind of changes its path but even if you assume uh, the end product of an evolution of a species of evolving is intelligence it's going to take a lot of time uh like so so i don't i don't really think like finding life elsewhere is going to be a very bad thing because like we always assume that they are going to be intelligent than us i would really think i would love to think which is also most mostly probable that life elsewhere in other part in even in mars it could have been like microorganisms i mean like why do you have to fear a bacteria so um it is going to be interesting but i don't i don't really think we should really worry about this thing i mean like also it might actually change our mindsets and and on and the planet so we we have this thing of uh, assuming that like we are the only ones around i mean like like if you find another life forms in this one they might have different beliefs which is totally different from us i mean like that's that's another sort of existence that i think can actually change the mindset of a lot of people on the planet but like i don't really think um uh it's going to be a very bad news it it, it is a good news actually let's keep that optimism going okay so you didn't mention that the probability of life existing out, out there is very high so if i and you studied a lot of ancient multicellular organisms you studied really fascinating creatures so if i were to ask you to engage in a thought experiment and think of or maybe paint a picture of one possible extraterrestrial life form what is one form that you think they might exist in that seems likely to you oh i think i would say single cellular or anything like a bacteria so again like i i, I like my apologies to push you back to the uh, older time periods uh it's just called the boring billion so for example when you see that one that's a banded iron formation that dates back to 3 billion years old So there was a time when the earth the first life started the first spark of life which is which is something it's more like more like a holy grail for all uh, everybody we just wanted to know the first form of first life form that's our ancestor all of us are linked to oh, that one cell yes, that the, yeah yes the most uh, the yeah. universal common ancestor uh, but the thing is like uh, we don't know how it happened and we might never know how it happened because it happened incredibly long long ago uh, but 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 the thing is like the moment that happened but interesting that most the uh, amazing thing happened for the next 3 or 4 billion years nothing really i mean like 3.5 billion years nothing much happened i mean like it was just bacteria or it's called geologists call it the boring billion because uh, in, in an evolutionary perspective so for example you just go to cambrian explosion which happened like 550 million years ago we call it cambrian explosion like suddenly you start see multicellular animals different sort of animals weird creatures that you can't even imagine in fossil record but if you just go before that one you might find some sort of animals in the ediacaran uh, deposits like weird animals you don't even know whether if they are if they are plants or animals but the thing is like even if you if you go beyond ediacaran you won't see anything you would just see bacteria normal unicellular algae animals just like that one so it's called a boring billion so so uh, the majority of the life on earth was unicellular so if you ask me like if there is going to be uh any life forms in other parts of the this one i would i would read my, my bet would be like a bacteria or or any or, or a different sort of bacteria or anything that resembles a bacteria nice. yeah the cambrian explosion is also the period where a lot of the uh, organisms went from the oceans to the land as well yeah it was mostly bound to the land during the cambrian period right. but the only thing is like why cambrian period is very uh, interesting is like it's it's more like there were animal uh, it, when you say the explosion even uh, in a geological point of view it took several million years <laughs> so it's not really an explosion <laughs> but but you suddenly start to see different animals so um, so some people uh, uh, say that that was a time when all the phyla uh, got established uh, so but it took a, its own time it took like 50 or 60 million years Uh, to get to where it is people always forget that our ediacaran fauna uh, 600 million years ago there were still animals that uh, that were as fascinating as cambrian explosion only thing is like cambrian explosion we have we suddenly have more animals more forms of animals the like animals called like picaya uh, early trilobites so there are animals like holocygenia like uh, it like it looks like if you just like 
hallucinating and imagine an animal it's just going to be there and uh, there are animals like animal acaris different ones the only thing is like people actually use it um to say is, uh, animals suddenly started appearing but when the suddenness means like it took its own time it was it was not a sudden so we have covered the initial period where certain proteins got together and made the first cell that is everyone's ancestor and then i'll just millions of years down the line some of the single cell organisms started to band together in a kind of a symbiotic relationship and could form multicellular organisms mm-hmm. how did that all come about and then there was a period called the great oxygenation event so what is that and how did we reach there as well we we don't really know how the first life came into be uh, it's a question that uh, i don't know some people it, it 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 might sound a bit pessimistic that we might never found an find an answer because like as i said before it happened incredibly long long ago and we can't recreate the exact uh, environment again so so but there are many uh, theories uh, um, that can ac- actually explain to some extent how it might have happened so the first life was very simple it was not definitely a first cell a first cell when uh, the most popular misconception is when people say the first simple cell so but when the thing is like if you just look into a cell the the machinery over there is absolutely amazing so it's really 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 complex so so when we say the first life form uh, is the first self replicating molecule it could have been uh, a, a primitive rna a ribonucleic acid yeah. and then it started making a copies of its own and then it actually found itself in a small chamber where it can actually um, uh, be safe from the external environment there are many places many theories that says where the first life could have uh, originated some people the most plausible one is the black smokers where you just go deep down in the ocean you can actually see the hydrothermal vents so these actually create it's a very hostile environment it's very hot it's very acidic and alkaline and but the thing is like there are small pores so some people actually if you there's an excellent book on this one called by uh, nick lane uh, so uh, some people argue that there is a small cavities in these black smokers that can actually create a specific environment uh, for cells to form so basically these small cavities could have served as the first cell wall where the first uh, self replicating molecule found its way and then uh, like a lot of uh, evolutions took over the moment uh, the first cell or the first molecule started self replicating made mistakes and then it's it form it took a lot of time took millions of years probably to become a first unicellular simple cell yeah so i just don't mean, i don't mean to interrupt you i just had a question here as well i read somewhere that the mitochondria itself was a separate absolutely organism absolutely that merged with the cell and that's True. when it that's that's very fascinating i mean like so un- until recently uh in 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 50s and 60s uh people started looking into uh, so basically when we think about evolution so evolution is like when we have a variation nature selects it from so the thing is like people think m- mutations are the only sort of variation so if you want a mutation to happen if you want extra genetic material you have to there are jumping genes uh, there are genes that like take small pieces from your own genome and like push it here change genetic switches and other things but we also now know that like we also started taking genes from other organisms itself so what happens is like when you look at chloroplasts uh, in plants and if you take my- mitochondria they look like superficially if you the cell organelle itself looks like a s- separate cell it kind of divides into uh, in fission like it kind of breaks away into two small pieces it reproduces but the, the thing is like it also has a separate nuclear um dna it has its own dna it has its own genome so when people started comparing all these ones the human mitochondrial dna the genome is closely related to a bacteria than to humans the chloroplast so basically uh, uh, looking at all these ones so several uh, million years ago um, uh, there was a bacteria there's one more bacteria that it sort of engulfed and the thing is like instead of digesting it totally it started putting itself to work it's more like i i eat you now all your job i'm going to give you protection i'm going to just like help you survive all you have to do is like produce energy so i can actually run my own machinery right. so it's it's more like uh, like we put these little bacteria to work so it it didn't happen once it happened many times so um this is like uh, it's it's a symbiotic relationship so all the mitochondria in our so mitochondria is the power cell so it it is the power currency it is how what's fueling our cell so the chloroplast in plants and the mitochondria in our body did come from a different bacteria 
Oh, that's fascinating. You did mention about how we will never find out about the origin of life. There's a theory that's uh, called panspermia, which is that life actually emerged on one of those asteroids or meteorites and it, when it crashed into earth that's when it landed the microbes here is that something you look into much well i mean like it, it is also plausible like uh, but the thing is like it's not answering the question i mean like the question is like how did life came into being how, how the first the origin happened but the thing is like when you say like it came from space but it's it's more like you're pushing the question to an asteroid i mean like like i can always come back and then say like how did that life, life begin yeah. So it is it is uh, in my opinion it's not answering the question but it's it's trying to just like you know push it away from us so that it doesn't look very daunting uh but i i i personally believe life uh, evolved separately in it, it's still evolving like separately in different yeah. parts of the universe but it did happen here on earth uh, with all the climatic conditions and everything it did origin uh, like panspermia mean, yeah it could have been possible but evidence just point out that like it, Okay, very interesting segment. All right, so before we dive further, like I said, we have to keep doing these lame jokes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I made a commitment. So the third one is, why did the Archaeopteryx catch the worm? I got it. It's an early bird. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know these jokes. We are WhatsApp forward. <laughs> okay, so let's continue the along the line. Uh, let's ignore this one diversion. <laughs> And let's continue along the line of talking about these really fascinating evolution of life. Actually, before that, uh, if I had to ask you, what is one organism that really fascinates you? You've spoken about uh, organisms that look like you're hallucinating, and then absolutely, uh, and then we have all these uh, organisms in the oceans that are we still haven't discovered many of them, and they're all so fascinating. Octopuses in general really fascinated me as well. And you've spoken about coral reefs in the past. Um, that's uh, I'm not even sure what to call them, but that's also a very fascinating organism in a way. And then I've come across the Portuguese man of war and those kind of creatures as well. So if I do ask you, what are some of some of these creatures or organisms that really fascinate you that you would love to know more about? I would say this animal over here. So this is a ammonite. So so basically these are cephalopods. These are more related to modern day octopuses. And but the thing is, like these guys went extinct 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct. If dinosaurs are the worst hit animals on on the land, uh, ammonites are the worst hit ones in in, in, in the sea. Right. So the thing is, like ammonites have been so abundant in ancient seas during Jurassic, even before that one, Permian, Jurassic, they were absolutely everywhere. So if you just go, I mean, like they came in different sizes and different shapes, um, and this is the normal shape. They're coiled and other ones. Uh, but the thing is, like when the asteroids struck Earth. Uh, but the thing is, like, it sort of increased the acidity of the ocean. So the popular idea, the understanding is, like, ammonite babies, when it, when it hatch out of the eggs, they come to the surface of the ocean for feeding. Yeah. But the thing is, like, when the acid, when the when the impact happened, the ocean was so acidic. So when the babies actually go down, go to the top, the shells dissolve. So when they without a shell, they can't survive and they died. But the thing is, like, strange thing is, like, these ones, these are and nautiluses. So nautiluses, we do still see nautiluses around in our uh, oceans now. They are the words of extinction because their shells are so beautiful. And uh, for ornamentation purpose, these, these shells have been hunted. So they live in, uh, normally live in deep oceans. So what happens is like nautiluses survived because these babies, they, they give birth, they normally dwell in deep seas. The babies are in deep sea. They survived. They all went extinct. But they Kind of different shapes and sizes. The smallest one that I found is, I would say, this size of this Lego block. Um, the biggest one is like, say, one meter in diameter. They were really huge uh, ammonites. It's more like a coiled submarine. So they are carnivores. Uh, but the thing is, like, assuming the fact, like, 66 million years ago, they just like went vanished, and they ruled the sea before that one. That's that's sort of things that fascinates me a lot. We don't, uh, there are plenty of unknowns. We don't uh, uh, know how many tentacles they had. Some people say eight, some say 15, but we don't know. We don't know what color they were like because the colors do not survive. But what impresses me is that um, the amazing details that you can actually see. These are called suture patterns. So it's more like an interlocking. It's more like a Lego block. So for example, you have two Lego blocks that perfectly fit into each other. 
But imagine these Lego blocks are irregular and they still fit into each other like a zigzag puzzle. It's like having a zigzag puzzle uh, all around as a shell. And one more thing is like when I I, I really love uh, gastropods and uh, cephalopods like these ones because like we kind of grow and we don't have the same body that we had when we were a baby because we replace cells and other things. But when it comes to a cephalopod like this, what fascinates me is like that's the baby. It still carries its baby self. So every every year it keeps adding one right. shell over the other. So basically this is if this is the last segment it can actually go back and see what it was like when it was a baby so it carries its own life history along with it wherever it goes and that's like 86 million uh, years so that's that's an animal that fascinates me every time i go fossil hunting i find a lot of gastropods i found a lot of bivalves but every time i find a ammonite pick i can't contain my excitement absolutely beautiful creatures and they actually actually help geologists in so such uh, amazing ways. These guys evolved very quickly, so they actually serve as uh, 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 markers for different time periods. So you 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 see one ammonite. This is one sort of ammonite that you see in sixty uh, eighty five million year old sediments. These guys evolve into a different one uh, uh, in younger areas. So without even having to date the rocks that you find these fossils, just by looking at these fossils, these are called index fossils. Looking at these fossils, you can actually predict what the age of that sediment would be like. So we took a lot of interesting diversions along the way, but we were trying to discuss the great oxygenation event. So what was it? What happened? So so if, if you take a time machine, um, so we think about going to Mars, we think about going to the moon, we need a special suit. Uh, and even if you just go to the bottom of the ocean, you need an oxygen mask because yeah. you know that you can't breathe that one. There are environments in Mars and other places where the oxygen is very low. But imagine like if you uh, take a, I mean, like a, take a time machine and just go back in time, like say four, three billion years ago, you can't really breathe because the oxygen back then was very low. There were not so much of free oxygen around. So uh, it was there for a very long time, just like that. The environment was stale and not too much oxygen. At one point, there was a bacteria called cyanobacteria that evolved um, uh, a, a trait where it can actually manufacture its own food. So when it did, oxygen was a byproduct. So basically now we actually inhale oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide. Imagine like uh, uh, billions and billions of uh, cyanobacteria doing the same thing. And what happened is like at one point it started uh, depositing so much of oxygen, the oxygen content in the atmosphere went up. At one point animals I mean, like when I say animals, like microorganisms were not suited for oxygen-rich environment. So it uh, created an environment which was dangerous for other animals. So there was an extinction even that happened. So oxygen at one point was a, was was poisonous. Even now, like you can't really take in pure oxygen. You have to mix it with other uh, gases. So animals started dying. But at one point, what's really uh, strange happened is uh, that's a time when there is not too much of plants and trees on the ground on on the land so the thing is like the the erosion was high so when it rains on the land uh, there is no trees to hold back all the sediments so sediments actually flow and gets deposited in the oceans so what happens there is empty there's a lot of iron uh, ferrous so this oxygen the bacteria produced went and reacted with that iron and it started oxidizing like there's a process of oxidation. Yeah. So so it's it's normally when you you call rusting. So you just take a piece of iron, like dip it in water, just keep it outside. It's going to rust. It's going to turn into red. So what happened is like this oxidized iron started setting down to the bottom of the uh, uh, ocean floor. And it kept adding again and again and again. That's something that we call it as a banded iron formation. So banded iron formation is not a direct fossil like these ones. So this is like a, a fish that died 125 million years ago went down to the bottom of the uh, the river, quickly get uh, buried by the sediment and ended up as a fossil. That is more like uh, a trace fossil. So that is a bunch of iron molecules, oxidized iron molecules deposited down in one thick layer. But that was done by bacteria producing oxygen. So that, that, that I mean, the, the great oxygenation even, it, we call it GOE, it happened several times. So the first time it happened, it was because of bacteria. The second, third time it happened, that was because of volcanic eruptions that started releasing a lot of uh, 
underwater volcanic eruptions. So the first time it happened, it was organic. It was because of animals. So that it, it, it's kind of a weird thing, like, like animals producing something which was dangerous for the same animals. So we survived. And we moved on, like went into multicellular life. Yeah, very interesting. And you you began this conversation talking about randomness. In a way, talking about entropy as well. And now you're talking about the oxygen oxygenation event. So I want to check another theory with you. This is uh, something I came across in the book Life 3.0 by Max Stegma. And then I also heard it again in an interview uh, by this developer, David Silver, where he said that the universe is always trying to move towards uh, a place of randomness and chaos, maximizing entropy all the time. So when it, so if you take the example of the great oxygenation event, when there was a high amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it was starting to see there's some structure that these kind of organisms evolved to take in the carbon dioxide and create more chaos once again. And if you really look at it, then animals evolved to then exploit that extra oxygen in the atmosphere and then once again create more chaos. Another way of looking at it was that uh, when trees and forests evolved, they took in all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and created these structures, these forests that are very rigid that start compartmentalizing the carbon. And there was nothing that was breaking it apart. So in a way, humans have evolved to cut down the trees and engage in deforestation and then create more chaos and randomness once again in the world. Is this something you believe in? Well, I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, <laughs> it could be right. But yeah. uh, that, that that was like kind of, uh, when, it, when it comes to paleontology, we kind of uh, love to think about uh, victorious species. I mean, like species rising up rather than uh, saying that uh, they they create chaos. But the thing is, like, I don't know, because, like, when it, when it comes to the natural world, it's always a competition between different... So so when you say uh, one sort of animals rise up to create chaos, I mean, like, uh, I don't think... Chaos is, like, happening every now and then. Like, chaos is happening now. Then it's, right now it's happening. So basically, the uh, when, when Darwin came up with this origin of species, the first part, that important part is, like, competition competition for resources. So there is one set of resources that are different organisms competing, competing for that resource. The one that manages to get it most leaves more offsprings, man it, but the one that does not, does not leave offspring and they, they, they move towards the path of extinction. So that chaos is not happening at certain areas. It's not like um, there's a period of uh, tranquility, nothing, peace, total peace, like 100 million years of peace. And then suddenly something happens and there's more chaos. The chaos is a part of evolution itself. It's right. happening every day, every in every cell, even within our body. So, for example, imagine like autoimmune disease. Your your your, your immune system kind of mistakes your own. So basically, when uh, when um, women get pregnant, uh, there was a point at the the immune system actually does not recognize the fetus, and it tries everything to kill that fetus. But then there is a miraculous step, a bi biochemical step that kind of bypasses that one. So there is chaos not within our body itself. It's happening every day. There is bacteria getting an uh, immune system fighting that one. We got the vaccine. Uh, it is still fighting COVID that we can't see. So the yeah. chaos, are, if you ask me from an evolutionary point of view, it is happening every day. And natural selection is kind of channelizing the chaos that is created and channelizing all the genes towards one path. So, so yeah, I would say like the chaos is like, it's, a, it's an everyday. Interesting because even Richard Dawkins said the same in the book Selfish Gene, where he said, and he had a word for it, call it the evolutionary stable strategy, where organisms are involved to exploit something that's in excess. So if there's higher oxygen, then organisms are involved to exploit that. Absolutely. So, yeah. so Absolutely. You and Richard Dawkins are in agreement about that. <laughs> okay, so you didn't mention fossils, and I definitely want to talk about fossils. And to introduce this segment, I have the last lame joke of this episode. <laughs> And I promise it's over at the end. <laughs> so this one is, what do you call a fossil that never wants to work? Um, <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> Lazy bones. <laughs> Signing off. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about fossils. So mm. what is a fossil? Uh, a fossil is, uh, there are different types of fossils, but like if generally a uh, fossil is the remain of an animal, remains of an animal that went extinct or lived long, long ago. So what happens is like, uh, imagine um, this is a, a bivalve, this is a seashell, like a clam that you just find normally in beaches. So uh, most of the time, these clams can be destroyed by waves. They can break into smaller pieces or bacteria and other things can eat the soft parts inside and disintegrate and it's gone forever. 
But on rare times, what happens is like when an animal dies, it settles down to the bottom of the ocean or a river or a desert environment, and it has to be quickly covered by sediments. So when it quickly gets uh, covered by sediments, it's kind of protected uh, from any scavengers. So animals, foxes or any other animals can't go and eat them. And uh, bacteria, there is one point then when the bacteria cannot act on hard shells like these ones. So what happens, there's a process called mineralization. When the environmental, the minerals in the environment replace the organic material in that. So it, when, when the replacement happens, they end up as a fossil. Uh, so basically it can be a cast, it can be the actual fossil itself, but mineralized version of that one. And it can be a, a negative or a positive cast. So a fossil is nothing but a remain of an animal that lived millions of years ago. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if you ask me uh, if there is anything that is 10,000 years or older, that is a fossil. So anything that is 10,000 years or younger, it cannot be considered as a fossil. So basically you pick up a Neanderthal bone, Neanderthals went extinct 38,000 years ago. So that's technically considered a fossil. But if you just go and pull up a bone in Harappa and Mohanjadaro, you cannot call that one as a fossil. It's, a, it's an ancient bone. So is it necessary for it to have formed in an uh, ocean? Oh, no, no not, not really. Not really. Uh, uh, these are called uh, the environments in which it is formed. That can actually give us more an uh, idea about how the rocks were formed. So, for example, if you take these ones, uh, these are deposited in a shallow marine region. Uh, sometimes uh, some of these, these are found in deep oceans, an area when, when it is totally deep. And this is a fossil of, a, it's a petrified tree. So this is a terrestrial environment. So most probably there was a river flowing. The, the tree died and, and fell into a river and it washed down into the uh, sea. So, and this uh, fish, uh, mostly a river. So, so, so water has to be involved at some point. Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Sometimes even in deserts, you can actually find fossils because like, for example, like it has to be preserved, but most of the time sedimentary rocks are formed underwater. So it has to, I mean like 99% of it involves water. Rivers, deltas, deep sea, shallow marine regions. So are we lucky to have witnessed, or I mean, uh, excavated all the fossils that we have? Is there a very low probability of getting fossils or it's a very common occurrence? Fossils are quite common. Uh, so it's, it is everywhere. And it's only, only thing is like 99% of the whole animals that ever existed went extinct and like you don't see them anymore. And there are not all the animals that like died out before end up as fossils. Uh, the reason why we don't find fossils in Ediacaran or Cambrian period is like only those animals with hard parts end up as fossils. Imagine a jellyfish. Like imagine an ocean full of jellyfish. Like I, I, would, I would like to say, for example, imagine an ocean, a pond, a pond full of uh, hard-shelled nautiluses and then uh, jellyfish. Uh, but jellyfish has very um, soft body. It will not end up as a fossil. You'll find fossils only of nautiluses. So you, you can always say, Pond is full of nautiluses or not jellyfishes. So most of the animals that like never left a trace, very few percentage of these animals ever, uh, that lived before left a trace. So fossils are abundant. They're found in all the continents. Even in Antarctica, they found fossils. Antarctica was once very warm. They found fossils of trees and uh, it was once very a tropical area. And there were uh, Arabia, like it was very cold at one point. There, were, there are different areas, but fossils are found in all continents. They're found in mostly sedimentary rocks they found in. And uh, you, won't, you won't find fossils in igneous rocks, rocks that are very hot. Lava, magma, igneous ones, you don't find fossils in that one. Mostly in sedimentary rocks, but they are common. You just need to know where to look for. So you mentioned that we have missed a few fossils. One of the areas of debate, and a lot of people use this as an example of evolution is wrong, <laughs> is the missing link. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I love this. So what is the missing link and uh, what what do you think? Why does it exist? Uh, people say like uh, uh, most, instead of a missing link, we can actually say a transitional fossil. So we know that uh, there were primitive fish-like ancestors that left the sea, uh, the water, and they went to the land, the early tetrapods. So uh, the fins were repurposed as legs and limbs. So they can actually survive uh, in the land. And their uh, swim bladders or gills were repurposed into lungs. So they actually breathe uh, oxygen on the land. So, so here in this case, like they found uh, a missing link called tiktalik. So tiktalik served as uh, a missing link between um, the terrestrial tetrapods and uh, the sea ones. 
So we can actually say this is one. But the thing is, like when you say a transitional fossil or a missing link, it's it's kind of really tough. So for example, imagine I uh, I take this one and I take this one. So there is going to be one missing link over here. There can also be another missing link in between these two. So there can be another missing link between these. So I can actually add infinite number of generations in between. So so a missing when you say missing link, it is kind of wrong to say every an individual animal is a missing link. So so sometimes evolution happens within millions of years. Sometimes yeah. it takes a very long time. It takes 10 or 20 million years. Sometimes it happens within a few thousand years. We evolved lactose tolerance uh, 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. Before that one, we couldn't digest uh, milk. So so it's really, it's it's totally wrong to say, when people say, like, show me the missing link, I can actually show you any fossil and that's a missing link. So it's it's more like there are there can be multiple infinite number of points between two dots and anything can be a missing link. I can choose one here, I can choose one here. That's a missing link. That's a missing link. So every single animal, every single individual, every fossil is in a way is a missing link. The main argument they use is for is for Homo sapiens, where I think there is a few transitional fossils that are missing between from apes to yeah. final Homo sapiens. So is that something you looked into, or is just like conspiracy theory? Oh, yeah, I mean, like we, we, I mean, like the thing is, like that's that's one 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 amazing thing is like we know more about animals that lived millions of years ago. We can actually pick one dinosaur and say this evolved into this. But the thing is, like when it comes to human evolution, the thing is, like the tree gets shaken every now and then, every year. So for example, we we've been digging only for the past hundred years, like like very recently. We keep finding new. Um, uh, fossil hominids every year. For example, two couple of years ago, we found Homo luzuensis in Luzon's uh, island in Philippines. Before that one, we found Homo naledi. So if you have to happen to draw a chart 10 years ago, you would not include all these ones. I mean, like, the thing is like, uh, until recently, like at least uh, five, six years ago, we thought the earliest Homo sapiens, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, are 200,000 years old, based on the Homo specimen in Ethiopia. Now we found uh, fossils in Israel and Morocco, Jebel Irud and other places that we, that had pushed it to 350,000 years ago. So we keep finding more fossils. The more fossil, uh, the the definition, the resolution becomes good. Uh, so as of now, if you ask me, if we are looking at human evolution in a 720p pixel. And the more fossils that we find, we can upgrade it to a high definition one. So when we say missing link, it is it is somewhere over there and waiting to be found. We just haven't found it. But when we found it, it's it's, it's more like a missing piece of puzzle. We we just need time. Okay. So if you, if I gave you a genie's lamp, and you were allowed to get three wishes, what three mysteries in either archaeology, paleontology, or astronomy, what three mysteries would you like to solve? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I I definitely will regret later. I should have asked something else. But, yeah. uh, but I'll just like yeah. since I'll just like uh, post it. Like one thing is like I really wanted to know what color the dinosaurs were. I would really love to just travel back to the Cretaceous period, but I would really want to go to the day before the asteroid struck Earth, and I want to stay back. So in one wish, I can actually see how the dinosaurs went extinct, and I can see all the dinosaurs, uh, the sound, the the color, the, the patterns, songs, yeah. and other ones. So they were not green, huh? <laughs> oh no <laughs> okay. they were colorful they were right. really colorful okay and uh, my second wish would be like i want to go back to the origin of life and um, with a really complex molecular biology set they can actually pick that first life yes of course like i'll be altering with the course of events but yeah i would really love to know the biochemistry of the first life how it all began the third wish would be like i would it's it's more archaeological like I would really love to settle this once and for all. Just like go back to the Bronze Age and Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. First thing that I want to know is like what language they spoke and how to decipher this script and what led to their downfall. If I can actually solve that one, like I would, I would be like solving a lot of political issues also. Of course, with that one. the Indus Valley Civilization. <laughs> yes. Okay, so if people want to start uh, looking for fossils, I want to get into it. What are some places, uh, you work in Maliha, here in Sharjah, and you've also explored Arialur in Tamil Nadu. 
what are some places that people can go out and then start getting into archaeology and also into fossils well um i i would say maleha we can start with maleha the thing is like um maleha is interesting uh, not because i've worked there but still uh, there is a reason why i just went there and joined there i think it's like that place is archaeologically interesting because you have evidences for humans living there 130000 years ago and in one single place you can actually find evidences for different time scales in human history you can actually find paleolithic settlement you can actually find neolithic settlements uh, there was a long list of bronze age settlements there in that area people lived during the iron age and late iron age so you can actually start from the earliest humans uh, uh, you can talk, discuss evolution of humans and then you can actually talk about the evolution of civilizations in that area and not too far away from that one the cave where they found stone tools dating back to 130000 years ago the cave itself is in a mountain that was once under the ocean 70 million years ago so right. so that is a place which is very close to i mean like we never thought of uh, uh, dinosaur time period fossils in sharja but it's it's out there so so that's i would say the first place that if you if you are living in the uae and if you want to start uh, paleontology your interest in paleontology or in fossils i would say that's the most easiest uh wait it's very accessible anybody can go there and uh, fossils are everywhere if you know where to look the right spot we can actually find tons of fossils in that area but it's not limited to sharja so there are places in jebel buhais which is not too far away from jebel fire mountain over there where you can actually find eocene sediments like 40 million year old sediments just go to jebel uh, jais which is uh, which is if you, if you're really interested in geology and tectonics and other ones jebel jais is more like somebody actually built a mountain after consulting a geology textbook <laughs> or somebody wrote a geology textbook after visiting uh, yeah. <laughs> jebel uh, jais it's absolutely amazing you can actually yeah. start from cretaceous you can go all the way to triassic sediments over there and then if you just go to different parts uh, in abu dhabi you can still find miocene deposits 10 to 5 million year old sediments it's all scattered everywhere it's just we just have to start looking so next time when you feel just like anybody uh, hike into a mountain stop next to a boulder and look carefully like what that boulder is made up of you will definitely see a fossil or two yeah next hike come definitely is going to be <laughs> my eyes open and i must i must drop a note here you also have a youtube channel called scientific tamilians where you try to spread knowledge um uh, for especially students i believe but it's open for everyone so what is the main purpose of it and uh, what's the experience been like for you Oh yeah um when we started the youtube channel uh, uh, our main idea was to um basically science is out there there are plenty of science channels we just wanted to just like pick out certain events and like look at from a scientific point of view so when you talk about new findings or human evolution there are plenty of misconceptions and we just wanted to just clear it off and one more thing is like we don't really believe in uh, simplifying things like we just wanted to present as it is so scientific papers are out there we just wanted to translate in a language that people can understand not necessarily simplifying it very much and we wanted to do in english first but the thing is like there is enough people doing it already we really wanted to contribute something to tamil speaking audience and when we went there we just didn't find uh, too many science channels and there are few science channels but the problem is like kind of misinformation out there uh, even seeing a channel that calls itself science channel um, talking pseudo science and other things we really wanted to just like go there um and we we chose youtube because like when people say youtube like there are plenty of misinformation in youtube because youtube is more like a visual whatsapp thing <laughs> so uh, we really yeah. wanted to get into that one because that's the platform that you want to go on to some change so so you have to start from there because when you're doing somewhere else like no one's going to notice and we wanted to do in tamil because like that's a language that we thought they need more um content in science so we started doing that one so we mostly stick to stuff that we actually do in real life so um, i i talk about geology paleontology and evolution and the co-founder uh, prabhu he talks about telescopes astronomy and other things i mean since this is something that we do on a daily basis we find it more easy so we can actually connect it with that content we can actually deliver it just like that so we have like say 95 to 96000 people following us now so so before we move on to our final questions i would love for you to interpret what we have built with the lego here oh yes so what have you built first well uh, i started uh, 
randomly yeah. putting yeah. things together. But then I, I thought, like I told myself that I'm building a museum. Oh. So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, the architecture, the older Victorian architecture. I, I, I grew in Madurai where I went to a college that was built in an indo saracenic uh, style. But still, I wanted to just like uh, move natural history museums from these old archaic yeah. buildings to something much more modern. So I would say this is like an industry looking uh, museum. But like, yeah, you can actually say this is like you start from the oldest one and you just go to humans and other ones. So as you go to the top, you go in different cycles of uh, natural history. Right. That's yeah. the origin of life. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. What do you think I've built? Uh, that looks more like a, a crane. Mm, a crane, yeah. I actually thought of a cooking range once again. Oh, yes. <laughs> like tap and <laughs> stop. Yes. And I, I, I could say like I can actually use this one to just transfer huge boulders that contains big fossils. Yeah. Like we have to airlift using helicopters. Yeah. I can actually use that one. Made it for you. So <laughs> you can use it. Okay, final questions. Mm -hmm. What is one mythological creature that you wish was true? Um, uh, mermaids. Mermaids. Yeah. Why? Well, you know, they are beautiful, and uh, fairy tales are full of mermaids, and like, uh, yeah, like you really want somebody who can who who can like transfer you to the deep oceans. I mean, you know, in the fables, mermaids can actually help you just go and explore uh, the ocean bottom instead of without having all this. Uh, uh, submarines yeah. so yeah i would I really love to have uh, a mermaid somebody who's very beautiful to help me guide through uh, the oceans and see the mysteries it holds let's hope that comes true oh yes <laughs> what are some books movies or people that have been very strong influences in your life um very tough question <laughs> it keeps changing every year right. uh but if you ask me uh, there is uh there are two people that i would say that uh, kind of changed the way that i look into uh, life uh first is uh, charles darwin and uh, basically, if you, if you, I mean, like, yeah, people do have personalities. Somebody who you hold high can have flaws. They, they, they would have done mistakes. They still can do mistakes and other ones. But if you ask me, like, if, if there is one person who's flawless, who's gentle, who knew what he's doing, who was a really good scientist, I would say Charles Darwin, uh, an excellent researcher and uh, an excellent writer. And the work that he have done, like, after, even after 150 years, we still talk about it. We still debate his ideas. And uh, we, before even the advancement in biology, he predicted a lot of things. So Charles Darwin, yes. And second person um, is more like a, 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 a really interesting guy from South India, uh, uh, E.V. Ramaswamy, or we call him Periyar. So he was a guy, I mean, like basically there are two kinds of rationalists. So rationalists who take who reads Bertrand Russell and become rationalist. And there are other people who look into social evils and who look into the society and they become rationalist. And they go like, this is wrong. So I would really uh, say Periyar and his work have kind of influenced me to think about social issues and how to approach them in a rational way. What's one book that you would always give to someone that everyone should read? Uh, <laughs> It kind of, it kind of, it's very tough. But I would say Sophie's World by Jostein Garda. So I, it, it's a novel. It's a really fat novel. But Sophie's World is a, it's a, it's a book about philosophers and philosophy. Uh, it's, it's more like a young girl gets um, postcards, and the postcards talk about different uh, philosophers. And it's, it's, it's an absolutely amazing book. I remember reading this book when I was traveling to my, uh, in my initial days in Dubai, I was felt so lonely. And I used to read this book in metros whenever I'm commuting back and forth to work, I read this book and it's absolutely amazing book. So if I, if you say, if there is one amazing book that I would really gift it to anybody, I would say Sophie's World by Jostine Garda. Interesting. I'm going to read that book for sure. What would you like your legacy to be like? Oh, yeah, it should be a long uh, line of thinkers. <laughs> I, I, I'd be just happy if they are also rich. Uh, uh, but yeah, it should be like somebody who contributed something. Like I, I, I look into people like Charles Darwin and you, you still see somebody who you discuss very actively, even after hundreds of years after he's gone, his work has been discussed. 
so it it should be like instead of uh, talking somebody's life, it should be uh, the ideas. work that he did, the ideas. It can happen at least like the ideas can actually change people even after a hundred years. Like that's something that I would really love to leave behind. Amazing. As a follow up to this, what do you think the human civilization's legacy should be like? You, what do you think we should collectively be working towards? Ah, uh, I think we should be working towards saving uh, the planet anyway. I mean, like, yeah, we. we uh, I think we should follow David Attenborough in this. He should be the patron saint of all uh, humans around. The thing is, like, now we have to. We if we we have the, uh, we have the chance, and we can actually save the planet from the eventual demise. I mean, like, it's going to go off anyway. Um, I mean, like we might not survive for millions and billions of years. I mean, like, there's one time the sun is going to go red giant. It's going to like you know uh, extinguish everything. Yeah. But still, like when we can actually have the limited time that we have, we should actually work towards more scientific progress. Uh, try to make uh, 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 life easy for everybody, and uh, work towards ending suffering in every society that we know about. So that's I think instead of moving to space. The first thing that we should humanity should work uh, is like end suffering in like all sort of humans on all the human societies. Right. Final question: What is the meaning of life? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is no meaning of life. Like you, you can actually say like uh, from a materialistic point of view, there is a purpose for life. I mean, like it's to spread the genes. Mm -hmm. We leave behind uh, descendants who carry the genes that we, the copies of genes that genes that we have. But when it comes to meaning, it's I don't think there is a meaning for life. Like we we live, we create meanings. Like it could be different from anybody. So I, if you ask me, like I would say, like yeah, I, I want to just like discover something. I want to change the way this particular field of science works. But it could be different from somebody else. Somebody says like I want to. I mean, my meaning of life is to keep my family happy. But I would I would say there is no universal meaning of life. I mean, like. There is purpose, but no meaning. I mean, like the purpose is to leave more uh, offsprings, more uh, copies of our genes into the next generations. But meaning of life, we create our own meaning, and let that meaning be something beneficial for not only for us but for others also. So uh, I would say, like be, being altruistic. Nirmal, thank you so much. If people want to find you online in person, where can they find you? Oh, they can actually find uh, me in uh, my YouTube channel, Scientific Thumberance. And uh, they can always send an email uh, to scientificthumberance at gmail.com. And uh, we are quite, I mean, like, we, we do respond to all the emails. We, we don't ignore anything else. Or they can, you can find me in Facebook, uh, in Nirmal Raja, N-I-R-M-A-L, or R-A-J-A-H. The same name in Instagram. Perfect. I do recommend everyone do check out Scientific Thumberance. It's a great channel, and I'm definitely following it. Uh, Nirmal, thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.